Hello, this is Tomasz Gruszkowski from the IFLA Pack for Digital Preservation at National Library of Poland. And I welcome you to a series of open webinars on digitization. So, here is Richard Davies from the British Library. The history of how the British Library has approached digitization over the last uh, 30 or so years. Um, and talk a bit about an uh, uh, initiative called Heritage Make Digital, uh, which is one of our uh, strategic priorities. And then Sandra will talk uh, more about the specific program around Heritage Made Digital that we've we've built and what the, the different aspects of, of that are and what we're trying to achieve. Um, so uh, my name is Richard Davis. I'm head of collection programs um, and uh, my colleague Sandra Topp and I'll, Sandra, I'll let you introduce yourself when you do your bit if that's OK. Um, if we could go to the first slide, just by uh, introduction, the British Library is the uh, UK National Library. It's the uh, a legal deposit library. Um, so we get a copy of um, anything published in the UK, be it uh, books, newspapers, magazines, uh, the, uh, the web as well. We archive the web. Uh, huge amounts of digital content. And one of the challenges that we've faced as a as a as a as a national library with with quite wide ranging, complex and um, large scale uh, collections is how to uh, transform the digital experience for users, how to make sure we're making as much as possible of the of the digital experience for users, how to make as many of our collections available as we possibly can uh, at scale. So I hope this this talk kind of talks us through, talks you through the, the library's approach and and, and um, at the end of all of our talks, we'd be very happy to talk to, to take any specific questions. Um, the British Library is actually a relatively young national library. Uh, so we were formed in 1973 um uh but our history goes back well before that uh so our history goes back to sort of 250 plus years ago uh at the beginnings of what was the british museum library and over that period we've expanded and joined up with other uh libraries in the uk the sound archive the patent office to form what became the the british library in 1973 um, if you go to the next slide, Sandra, Sandra just to give a, a flavour of the, the, the kinds of collections that we're, we're, we're dealing with in terms of what we try and make available digitally. Uh, the first thing is, is, is a, a challenge of scale. So we have about 170 million collection items, although uh, that number varies considerably, uh, essentially depending on how you count a collection item and uh, librarians among you will know the challenges of, of, of that all too well. But the collections span right across everything from printed books and ebooks, manuscripts, newspapers through to sound recordings, stamps and, and the UK web archive as well as our growing digital collections. Uh, if you go to the next slide please Sandra, the um, the, the starting point for us in terms of digitization, and, and I should say here that what, what I'm going to talk about is very much from the perspective of the British Library, so uh, from, a, from a national library's perspective and also, uh, you know, a, a, a large national library with a, with a large collection, so very much speaking on, on, with, with that in mind. But our starting point uh, when we started to look at what we would do digitally in terms of digitizing our collections and making them available was what you might call boutique digitization. So that was selecting individual collection items, real treasures like the Magna Carta or um, really, really high profile, important, unique heritage collection items that we would individually select, um, take high resolution photography of them and, and make available. Um, and these projects were um, very much about highlighting the, the treasures of the BL. And we went from that to, to if you go to the next slide, uh, sort of developing uh, themed collections and, and, and themes around virtual books, but still very much around individual collection items. Now, these are fantastic projects. They were a great way of highlighting the treasures and the unique and really, really important 
heritage items. But what it didn't really do was to deliver at scale a lot of the, the library's uh, collections. So we started to look at how we would make available larger swathes of our collection, looking across entire collection areas or where the priorities might be in terms of um, particular collection types. So on the next slide, we just highlight one example of that, which was looking at our newspaper collections. There was an imperative in terms of just the sheer amount of, of, of newspaper collections that we were um, able to make available physically. Um, there's huge conservation and, and condition um, challenges with, with some of our newspapers and the, the conditions that they were kept in. So we started to look at, well, how can we work with partners um, and, and seek external funding to develop a programme around uh, digitising our uh, at-risk newspapers and the, the, the newspapers that we want to, to, to really highlight to, to our users. On the next slide, um, just to highlight the approach that we took then in, in this is sort of the early 2000s was very much on a, on a project by project basis. So we had an overall approach. Our overall strategy was obviously to make as many much of our content available freely um, for all users anywhere in the world as, as, as quickly as we could. But we had to take a range of different models and we had to, to, to find various different funding sources for that. So we took a project by project approach and that meant that uh, over the last 30 or so years, we've built up a huge corpus of different collections, 769 to date, which make available um, over 150 million uh, images. But that the, there was a missing piece, a missing strategic piece was, well, actually, how we access those collections is of, often a very different user experience. We often, often have individual project websites, no one place to search across all of these collections. So we started to think about, well, how do we start to bring these things together a little bit? On the next slide, uh, we I, I just wanted to talk through some of the different models that we um, continue to use um, uh, to, to, to this day. And, and we very much have a, a variety of models that we'll, we'll, we'll use. We don't have a single um, process, a single funding model for digitization, we, we take a, a very broad view. So well, one element of this is digitization funded by uh, individual trusts and foundations with a particular interest in certain collection areas or a certain geographical region or a particular theme. Uh, and that would also include you know, individual donors, individual uh, patrons that we might approach to fund specific digitization projects. Now that might be on a very small scale, might be on, a, on an individual collection item or it might be on a, on, a, on a larger scale, such as our Greek manuscripts project, which over several phases has, has really transformed um, access to, to those materials um, and are now freely available online. Um, on the next slide, we highlight uh, an, a, 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 an entirely different model. So working in collaboration with our either private or, or public partners. So we work with a lot of publishers to make available our collections. Um, sometimes that means that the, the, the content sits behind a paywall. Now, wherever possible, we will want to make available our collections for free. We want to make them available freely accessible so that anybody can use them. But it's a very expensive process, as I'm sure everyone's aware of, of, of digitizing at scale. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll work with partners and publishers where uh, we they will support the costs of digitization and in return, we'll be able to make available uh, collections behind a paywall uh, for a limited period of time. And, and in other projects, such as our collaboration with Google Books, what we'll do is, um, is actually make available huge swathes of our out of copyright printed books, and Google uh, will make available that content for free on their website, as well as us making sure that we make it available through our own BL website and that actually we have a preservation copy as well. And on the next slide, just to highlight a, a sort of third strand of, of, of the types of models that we develop. The other is developing kind of very large, uh, multi-year, often sometimes multi-decade programs of work around particular collections. So in this case, our Save Our Sounds program um, is, is a, is a multi-year, uh, multi-project um, activity where we identified our sound archive as a real priority to digitize for preservation reasons. 
Uh, there were skills that we were losing in terms of how to manage and look after these collections, how to manage the equipment to play these uh, to, to, to play these collections. And so we developed a whole program, not just around digitization of the collections, but also around skills development, working with other partners throughout the UK and developing a, 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 a network of, of, of hubs to develop a, a training program to ensure that the skills around working with sound collections and audio collections are, um, are further developed and, and have a degree of longevity. We also use these programs to develop new technologies and establish new capabilities. So in the case of something like Save Our Sounds, which is very much a digitization program, actually the, 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 the digitization of the collect collections is, is just one element of a wider uh, program of work. If you could go to the next slide, please, Sandra. Um, but all of these different projects and programs, while individually producing kind of fantastic results, also presented a, a, a number of challenges. In addition to the the challenge of, of scale. How do we how do we really actually um, transform access as a, as a as a percentage of our collections digitally? How do we make sure that actually we're really making available large swathes of our collection, not just a, a small fraction? There were also a number of different challenges. So digital preservation is a really critical challenge for us. How do we ensure that we have the right infrastructure in place to preserve our digital collections? at scale, both in terms of born digital, but as uh, in terms of the subject of this talk, that the digitized collections. The sustainability of the online, uh, online resources was also uh, and continues to be a, a real challenge for us. So we've got lots of individual project websites around these fantastic projects, but they may be um, uh, they may be created only with project funding. So how do how, how do we sustain those resources? Uh, they may well be done with partners. Uh, you know, how do we continue to ensure that, that, that the, these resources are um, continue to be available online in the future? And the project by project approach, approach also meant that we continually lost expertise and experience. So we'd hire people for a particular project um, and they develop really, really fantastic experience of how to manage these projects, how to, to make our collections available. And then they'd leave at the end of the project. And, and, we, and it's very, very challenging around that. And there's also a, a fragmented online user experience whereby you have to kind of know which projects to find and look for if you're looking for particular collection items. There wasn't really one point of access to access all of these different digital resources. So what we started to do, on, and this is highlighted on the next slide, was to bring, bring together uh, in our last strategic review which was uh, produced a strategy for 2015 to, to next year um, five key priorities for us as a as a national library two of them were around our physical presence our physical building so our london base in st pancras and our yorkshire base in boston spa about renewing the infrastructure there uh, the storage facilities the, the the facilities for our users but three of the streams were very much about our digital um, services. So everyone engaged was 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 about what do we offer our users and, uh, and are we reaching a wider audience as possible? Everything available was about how we make our collections available, both physically and digitally. Uh, and Heritage Made Digital was a really critical uh, change program and, and portfolio, which looked at, well, how do we really bring together all of the lessons learned around digitization projects uh, how do we ensure that we're not losing any of our digital collections how do we ensure that uh, all of the lessons learned all of the ways of uh, of managing these projects are brought together in one place and we how do we build up capability to ensure that we have a kind of core uh, function that can look after our digitized collections on the next slide uh, please sandra um, so, so Heritage Made Digital to, 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 to go into a bit more detail and then Sandra can talk more about the, the specifics of the programme was really designed to sort of transform digital access to the British Library's heritage collections. And we did that in a number of ways. So on the next slide, um, there are a, a few of the programmes and projects that I've uh, that I've mentioned. We started to group together 
um, all of the different digitization activities that we do right across the library. And, and historically, many of these projects and programs have sit, sat in different parts of the organization and haven't necessarily talked to each other about what they're doing. So all of the major programs, like, for example, Save Our Sounds that I've mentioned, uh, in addition to our other significant programs, Endangered Archives and our partnership with the Qatar National Library, uh, were brought together under an overarching Heritage Made Digital portfolio. We also included all of our major and actually all of our smaller digitization projects as well. So if we go on to the next slide, I think it just gives a little bit more detail of that. So um, things like Google Books and uh, our Hebrew Manuscript projects and many, many other projects, the dozens of live projects that we have were all brought together, not as a, as a governance mechanism, because a lot of these projects were externally funded and would have specific reporting requirements that we didn't want to add the, to the burden, but it was really about bringing these individuals and teams together so they could talk to each other and they could have a forum for exploring how do we learn from each other and how do we ensure that the expertise that we're developing across all of these different fantastic activities um, is actually brought together in a strategic way. Um, and that's where the Heritage Made Digital program sat in. It was a, it was a change program that was brought about to look, address a, a number of key challenges um, that, I've, that I've sort of hinted at. And I think at this point, I'll hand over to you, Sandra, to talk more about that, that program. Great, thanks Great. very much, thanks Richard. Thanks very much, Richard. I hope thanks. you can hear me OK, everyone. Um, my name's Sandra Tuppen. Um, I'm manager of the Heritage Made Digital Programme. I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, I'm just going to talk um, a little bit more about the programme, um, as Richard has outlined, um, that sits within that wider portfolio. I'm going to talk about three, three areas, really, um, which are aims of the programme. First one, very much about improving the way we work with digitisation. Um, so we called that digitisation workflow improvement. Um, so I'll come on to talk about that in more detail in a second. Um, another important part of the programme was to be a little bit more strategic in our um, choice of what we're digitising. And I'll explain a bit more about how we went about that. And the third aspect is about making the content available, not just for people to use, but also for people to understand better how they can reuse the content once they've once they've got hold of it. So workflows, first of all, and what do I mean by workflow? I mean all of the different steps in a digitization project or program that one would go through to create and make available the digitized content. So in the British Library, we would have um, the selection of the content, so choosing which items we're going to digitize. Um, we would want to do a conservation assessment on the item before it's digitized to make sure that it's suitable for imaging and if necessary do any um, remedial work. We would want to do a copyright assessment on the item to make sure that it's um, it can be made available online. We would obviously do the imaging itself. We would want to have a quality control process of the images to make sure that they were all okay. We would want to catalogue the items if they're not already catalogued and probably create some extra metadata that relates to the digital images and then we'd want to prepare the content to be made available online, package it up and create the necessary files that would go along with it and then finally actually put it online. So until we started Heritage Made Digital we had processes in place for doing this as Richard said we've been digitizing for many many years, decades now, but there was not a central kind of set of standards, set of processes that people would use in the library. And because digitization had sort of grown organically in the library in various different areas, we hadn't really come up with a centralized way of doing it. So one of the key things that we've tried to do or we have now done within Heritage Made Digital is to establish um, a sort of standard workflow through which digitized projects would go. So rather than every project coming along new and a new team thinking about how it would work and how what standards they would use and what tools they would use. Um, we've put in place um, some central standards and also crucially a central team to manage digitization workflows. Um, so we went about 
that um, by recruiting uh, a team to kind of lead on digitization in the library, um, we called them the digitization workflow team. And the team currently consists of a workflow manager, three workflow officers and um, three um, support officers. And between them, they now oversee the process of digitization um, right from the beginning of the workflow to the end of the workflow. And the very beginning part of the workflow is to obviously scope out the projects, decide what's going to be done. We have an approvals board within the library, um, the digitization approvals initiative, digitization initiative approvals panel, which agrees whether something should go ahead. It has key stakeholders from across the library because obviously we want to make sure that if we're starting a new large project or program that we're not going to have a negative impact on another area of the library. And because digitization involves so many different activities, as I've outlined just now, we will have colleagues from all parts of the kind of the business as usual areas of the library that need to get involved in in the projects and programs. So we would want to make sure that they are um, able to take on particular work at certain times. So a key part of the work has been um, scheduling and making sure that we have the capacity in the various areas and can kind of provide flexibility to increase staffing in certain areas where required. We also set up um, what we call the imaging order book. Um, and this is a way of us being able to control and prioritize the work that's going through into our imaging studios. We've got studios in London and in, in Yorkshire in Boston Spa. They both handle digitization for the library, but they also um, increasingly now handle undertaking digitization for other archives. So they go out with their cameras and take take photographs in other institutions. They also um, provide our, um, our users with copies of, of material as, as researchers need them. So we needed to make sure that we had a, a kind of schedule that we could work to. Previously, it would be more of a case of individual curators going to the studio and trying to find out when they could fit in their particular work. But we now have um, much more structure in that we have a kind of prioritization matrix and everything needs to go through through that for our internal digitization so that we can make sure that the most urgent things are scheduled for the studio. That's also helped us to make sure that we don't have any downtime, that we don't have any photographers who don't have a piece of work to work on that day. We make sure we've got a steady pipeline of work and that there's always another item for, for everybody to work on as soon as they finished the next one. So that's made us more effective and more efficient in how we do our, do our digitization. Another key thing has been around data and how we record information about what we're doing. Um, before Heritage Made Digital was set up, every curator who was doing a digitization project would keep information in a spreadsheet about the items that they wanted to digitize. They'd send that to the imaging studio. When the items came back, they would just keep a note of it locally. So we've set up a central register for all of our internal digitization. Um, we've used SharePoint to do this because this has enabled us to um, set up different views. So every team in the library that's involved in the digitization, for example, conservation, can just see the work that's in their pipeline. They don't need to see a massive spreadsheet with data in it that's not relevant on that day. They just see the things that they've now got to work on and they will be able to pick one of those items and start working on it. When they finish their work, they mark it done and it will then appear in the next team's workflow. So after conservation have finished, it'll appear in the imaging workflow and the photographers can start work. So we gradually add to this data as the items go right through the workflow to the very final stage when we um, when we make them available online. Um, we're still working on, on standards. We um, are moving towards um, implementing one of the international standards um, for imaging and image um, quality control. We're still sort of working on that. We haven't got, got something in place yet, but we have made um, considerable improvements in how we um, how we do quality checking of images. So we've created guidelines that are used now by all teams who are doing image quality checking, quality control and processing. And we've also um, 
recently acquired a new digital preservation solution. Um, the library built its own first digital preservation um, store, which is the Digital Library System, or DLS. And that's been in place for, gosh, nearly 20 years now. Um, it's beginning to show its age. And with the vast increase in the, in the amount of content that we're acquiring and creating digitally, we needed to have a new solution. So we recently um, went out to tender and acquired um, an off-the-shelf product, which we're now working to install. And once that's available um, to us, we will be ingesting all of our content that's in our old digital library system, plus all of our newly created content and material that's not yet made it into the preservation store. And then once it's in there, it will be um, constantly monitored, um, fixity checked to make sure that the files are still um, as they were when they went in. And then from that store, they are fed through to our um, image display system and made available for people to use um, online. So we're kind of having some new external tools as well as improving our internal processes. So moving on to the other core area, which is new digitization. Um, as Richard has shown, we've had quite a number of different routes into digitization over the years, from working with commercial partners to working with individual donors. Um, we also work very closely with um, universities. We've had quite a number of projects that are research projects with a digitization element, which could be funded through one of the research councils. So those really were the ways that we were having new digitization done. The library wasn't really funding um, very much digitization itself. And one of the, I suppose, um, areas that we wanted to improve on was our ability to, to actually select what we want to digitize. Because although we, you know, we very much value our partnerships with our, with our, with our partners, when you're working with other people and they're bringing in the funding, the selection of the content is is quite closely tied to what what the partners' interests are, which is inevitable. So, in in doing our Heritage Made Digital program, we decided to put some of our own funding into digitization um, at scale for the first time, and this has enabled us to be more strategic in our approach to selection of the content. And you'll see on the screen the criteria that we've used um, in selecting content for the Heritage Made Digital program. So we wanted to select a range of, of content um, because we were finding, I think, with some of our previous work that um, perhaps some collection areas were less favoured by, by partners and that we were actually kind of having some gaps in what we were making available online. So we wanted to highlight some of the collection areas that weren't really available online already. Um, we're focusing on material that's culturally important, either in Britain or internationally. Um, another key driver has been material that's very fragile and vulnerable. So by digitizing and making available the digital images, um, the physical items can be can, won't be handled as much. Um, we very rarely restrict people from seeing the originals because quite often there could be a genuine reason why a researcher would need to see the original to examine the watermark or um, study the um, the gatherings in in the in the item that sort of thing. Um, but we can, through making things available digitally, um, take some of the pressure off the original items. And we've been focusing in the program on um, high profile and unique or rare items as, as somewhere where the library can really focus its own government funding. We are obviously a public public sector institution funded by the government um, to, to make sure that we're getting best value for what we're doing by focusing on material which is is unique or, or very rare and, and hasn't already been digitized by another, another institution. And the first bullet point and last are connected really. So um, we wanted to highlight things which are underrepresented in the collections. So what did we choose to do in the end? Um, we had a goal set by our um, 
our senior managers to digitize um, it was going to be 400,000 items. When we counted them up, we found we had 408,000, which is a slightly funny number, but we um, we agreed that we would make available 408,000 images of strategically chosen heritage items. And selection was made and we have digitized 800 incunabula, so very early printed books. And the drivers for that were that we wanted to make available all books, all incunabula that were printed in England, together with all incunabula printed in mainland Europe, for which the British Library holds the only known surviving copy. So we have just about finished that. I think we've got seven volumes left to do, but we're very close to having completed that. And we've made about 75% of the items available online so far. Um, the next area we wanted to focus on was um, 17th and 18th century manuscripts from England um, and actually we've included Scotland and Wales as well. Um, we had found that we were getting quite a lot of opportunities to digitise medieval manuscripts um, and 16th century manuscripts through um, philanthropic donations. Quite a lot of our medieval manuscripts are very beautiful and that's something that funders can be quite interested in. But we were finding that we didn't really, hadn't really done very much of our, say, historical and political manuscripts from the 17th and 18th centuries, for which the library holds very large collections. So we've done a good um, selection of those, and that includes historical, political, um, literary manuscripts, um, medical texts as well. Um, so a, a, a range of subject areas. And then the other two um, projects are focused on material um, from outside the UK. Um, we wanted to focus on collections which um, hadn't been made available, as I say, previously in, in the library. So the Ethiopian Manuscripts Collection is one that um, we'd wanted for a very long time to, to make available online and to make much more widely um, accessible through digitization. So we've done um, just over 300, 300 manuscripts um, of um, Ethiopian um, origin and the example there um, on the screen um, is one of the very beautifully illuminated manuscripts. And we also um, selected about 300 other Christian manuscripts um, from the Middle East, from other, other parts of um, other parts of the world to um, to highlight and to bring up to show alongside um, manuscripts from other religions that we've done through other projects. So through some of our other earlier digitization programs, we had digitized um, large quantities of material um, from our Hebrew manuscripts collection. And also um, we've been doing some Islamic manuscripts as well. So our Christian manuscripts collection um, has now been partially digitized to, to go alongside that. So as of yesterday, we had digitized 403,316 images of the 408,000 that we wanted to do by the end of, well, really by the end of this month, that's when we're hoping to finish the imaging and to get them all online by this time next year. I mentioned that one of the other key drivers was fragile the, the fragility of material. So we also decided to do a project on newspapers. As Richard said, we've been digitizing newspapers for quite some time. We've been working with our partner, Find My Past, to make newspaper content available in the British Newspaper Archive. Quite a lot of that material has been digitized from microfilm, but we had found that we'd got a, a large collection of material which has never been microfilmed. And these paper, based items are extremely fragile. As I'm sure many of you will know, um, newspaper um, publishing in the 19th century, um, the wood pulp paper it was printed on is now sometimes very, very fragile. So in order to ensure that people could still have access to the intellectual content of these, um, even if the paper itself becomes unusable, we decided to digitize um, a million pages from fragile 19th century newspapers. And I'm very pleased to say that we met the million page target um, about three weeks ago. And this content is all going into the British newspaper archive. And although that 
website, that platform is normally um, a subscription resource or is a subscription based resource. Um, all of the content that we've digitized through the Heritage Made Digital program is made available free. So you still need to register um, to have become, become a user of the British Newspaper Archive, but you can now um, search without being a, a paid up member for the free content and, and use the, all the usual tools that the British Newspaper Archive platform has to be able to do full text searching of, of that content. Um, one of the key things there was that we decided that we should do complete runs of the newspapers, so we haven't just picked the very, very most fragile volumes from whole runs of titles. We have digitized entire titles. Um, we had to think a little bit about copyright um, for, for these. Um, and we have taken a, a, I suppose, what one might say, a, a fairly cautious approach in that um, our safe date that we've agreed on for um, for copyright for printed material at the moment is 120 years after publication. So we've digitized content up to um, that date, but not not any younger than any younger than that. Another key area that we've been focusing on is what we call the legacy um, content, which is all the material that's been digitized over the last 25 years or so before we started Heritage Made Digital. And a lot of that is made available on various platforms. As Richard said, we've had lots of project based platforms. The master image files um, are stored on the library network, um, but there hadn't really been a project to audit these collections. So we've been doing a big audit, creating an enormous spreadsheet um, to identify the file locations for each um, set of images to do a copyright assessment because obviously some things would have changed copyright wise since the projects were first done and um, we're preparing all of that for ingest into the new preservation system and to make as much of this content available online as possible. This screen just shows a few examples of the various websites that we've had. So the digitized manuscripts platform was set up um, in about 2006. We've got our um, Sounds website, um, Discovering Literature is another British Library website. Um, and what we want to do now is move from this sort of project based approach, as Richard mentioned, to something where all of our content can be discoverable in one place and then you will click a link and you'll go out to find it wherever it is. Um, so some of it will still be available on third party platforms, but we aim to have as much material as possible um, available through our universal viewer, which is our sort of central image viewer. And a key driver, as I mentioned earlier, was to make sure that people knew how they can reuse content as well. So we've created a copyright statement for every item and that will appear next to it and will tell you as, as a user how you may reuse that content. Um, and another key thing that we've done is to adopt uh, what's known as triple IF which some of you may be aware of, is the International Image Interoperability Framework, quite a mouthful. And the British Library was one of the founder members of this consortium. And it's, it's really, um, its goal is to standardize the way digital images are made available online through um, use of APIs or application programming interfaces. There are about three or four APIs involved behind the scenes in this, but basically what it allows you to do is to use a, a standard approach to putting images online and it allows users to reuse those images by embedding them in their own websites or blogs or what have you. And for certain tools to be able to pull together those images from different locations and put them side by side so that as a researcher, one could compare two items that are held in different libraries. So in this example here, there's some a music manuscript, My Lady Neville's book from the British Library, and in, on the left and on the right, a manuscript held in Christchurch, Oxford, which is by the same copyist. And as a user using IIIF, they can pull together these resources from two institutions and look at them as if they were in the same place on their, on their screen. So our aim is to make as much of our material as possible available in IIIF. 
I'm going to hand back over to Richard now just to talk through um, what we're doing over the next few years. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Just very briefly to sort of um, bring this back round to our um, living knowledge strategy. So, so Heritage Made Digital was created at the beginning of, of our last sort of strategic um, review, our, our strategic cycle, and we're now starting to um, to plan what comes next in terms of the overall organisational strategy. Um, and so we've we've delivered a great deal within Heritage Made Digital, as, as Sandra's outlined, in terms of the team, in terms of the the, the, the capabilities and functions and and tools, uh, as well as a, a delivering a, a huge corpus of digitised material itself. Um, but what we need to make sure, of course, is that we don't then lose all of that activity um, when the programme comes to an end. So it's about making sure that um, we integrate all of these lessons, all of the, 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 cap the capability, all of the staff into uh, what we call business as usual, into core activity. How do we make this a permanent part of what the library does? While at the same time, ensuring that we continue to focus on that sort of change element of, of, of what we've been doing, constantly reviewing, adapting, making more efficient um, our ways of working. So continuous improvement, as, as we would refer to it as the library, is, is a major um, way of working for us that's really going to be critical. It's, in, it, it's making sure that it's not only the, the big changes that we think about in terms of uh, you know, creating teams and creating end-to-end -end workflows, but it's also the, the micro mini changes that we would continue to do, which often actually have a much larger impact um, and putting in place a process and a, and a culture within the organisation that adapts well to those sort of mini changes and can do things quickly. Uh, the British Library is a, is a large, you know, public institution with with a, a with a large body of staff. Isn't necessarily the most uh, nimble of organisations in terms of changing the way we do things, but we do want to instill in that that way of working in terms of how the HMD team have been working in terms of being very agile in terms of adapting to change very quickly, and seeing how we can roll that out across the wider organisation. Um, and so the, the timing for that's really critical, that we very much ensure that this is embedded within the strategic priorities for the next seven years. Um, and so that's, that's that's something we'll be focusing on over the, the next 12 months. I think at that point, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you all very much for listening. Uh, Sandra and I, our, our contact details are here, so we obviously uh, very happy to take questions right at, at the end, but also do get in touch separately if, if you would like to. Thanks, Thomas. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sandra Richards. I'm uh, very grateful for the presentation of your... Uh, I don't know, I do see uh, one point which is very much in common between the British Library and the Urban Centre for History, which will be uh, discussed in a moment by Alexandr, which is uh, change. Uh, you are, uh, you've had 769 projects in the last uh, 20 or so years, and then decided to, um, well, basically unify maybe not the projects but your approach to them and uh, probably that uh, the results will be uh, comparable similar adhering to the same standards so it's a major change i would say but uh, well alexander i guess you will be uh, Speaking about the change, which yes. was forced upon you. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Thomas. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar. It's a big pleasure uh, to represent our project and uh, our institution, especially in these uh, hard times. And it's already one month since the 
uh, war, the full-scale invasion of Russia started uh, in Ukraine, and of course, it's it affected our plans. Uh, it's challenged. A lot of uh, institutions uh, in Ukraine, which are working as uh, archives, libraries, museums, as well as reached uh, all the families uh, in our country. So I'm going uh, to introduce you our institution and our experience, as well as uh, the projects, challenges uh, that are uh, that we have. Uh, now that we faced now since the war, so how uh, how they changed, and maybe it will be like helpful uh, for the and fruitful for the discussion. So I'm going to <clears throat> uh, turn on my presentation mode. Um, just one moment. Yes. Just let me know if you see my screen. Yes, yes. yes. So I'm working uh, at the Center for Urban History of East Central Europe in Lviv, uh, Ukraine. This is small but very active institution, which works in field of uh, research of urban history, uh, public history, academic ex exchange. Uh, and also digital history. It's located in Lviv, in Western Ukraine. That's our building, which now turned into shelter for refugees from the eastern part uh, of uh, Ukraine because of war, war. And also it became the home for few institutions and historians who moved to Lviv because of war. So now we are sharing our space uh, with the people from all the country, but also from, with volunteers who are coming to live uh, from the Poland, for instance, and other countries who are uh, coming with, the, with and bring some aids uh, for Ukraine so they can just uh, live here and sleep here. Uh, at uh, our venue, so the war also affected our plans, which were, which we were doing in, uh, regularly, like during the last year. So, and me personally, I am co coordinating the project which called uh, Urban Media Archive at the Center for Urban History. It's the one of our uh, digital projects which uh, which works with digitizing and uh, providing the access to the collections of uh, images mostly photographs moving images such as videos and films uh, home movies news reels uh, also we are collecting uh, oral history interviews so one of the parts of our archive is the digital born files as uh, interviews uh, collected on the different research uh, topics and also uh, we collected the collection of uh, maps of the cities uh, which are available for the visitors at our uh, web page we are really a small initiative and only few people are working with this uh, project but we are trying to uh, work in field of endangered archive or as we call it archives which are on margins uh, that are not considered as uh, important by the governmental uh, institutions or also we are trying to support some smaller institutions and smaller museums libraries and collections to digitize uh, uh, their sources and uh, their archives uh, and uh, also we are mostly working with the private and family archives which are important for our research focuses and also uh, but hardly accessible for the researchers uh, who are working with uh, different topics which are related to the uh, urban history 
uh, in the East Central Europe, but still we are uh, considering uh, our focuses very wide, so you can find uh, different uh, materials and uh, different uh, sources in our, our collections and of course the providing the access uh, to our collections of uh, images videos uh, 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 and other materials is uh, crucial uh, for us so we have the online access uh, to the collections through the, our web page but also we providing the researchers the access at our library like the offline access to the materials which are stored at our library which are uh, at our server which are not described and not ready to be published uh, at the uh, at the web page because probably the biggest challenge uh, is uh, with description of the new, newly digitized uh, materials as we are working with the private collections, uh, family archives, uh, like the, or for instance, the private archi professional archives of the architects is the thousands of images and thousands of uh, materials that uh, need to be described. So it's took a long time, like sometimes it's the years uh, to describe and publish uh, such kind of archive. So we are also providing the offline access just to the raw files and uh, to the raw uh, digitized uh, sources. We are not storing the original archives uh, at our place. We are just uh, digitizing them and giving back to, to the institutions or to the uh, owners because we don't have the expertise and also facility, uh, facilities uh, to store uh the archives but still we have uh, some collections which are really endangered so we are not able to uh, transfer it uh, anywhere so uh, we are keeping them in our uh, institutions and talking about the uh, focuses and also our collections which are relevant uh, to the actual events I want to mention our project, which which started nine years ago, which called industrialization and urban landscape landscape of the industrial south of the Russian Empire. That's the project uh, created by the histor Ukrainian historian uh, Volodymyr Kulikov, uh, who collected the imagery from uh, different small uh, uh, and uh, small and profile museums in the Donetsk uh, region. And the next year after this project, uh, this uh, Donetsk Oblast uh, was invaded uh, by Russia uh, eight years ago. And some of the museums became a part of self-proclaimed uh, uh, Donetsk People Republic. Uh, for instance, the collection from the Hordivka Museum that we have available on our webpage. Now we don't know the what condition of the museum. We didn't have any connection with them uh, since the Russian invasion in 2014. And since that, since that event, we were really conscious about the importance of working in this uh, territory and collecting the archives. And we were also mentioning uh, these cases of uh, the collection that became collections that became occupied but still uh, available at least online and still we know what what is there uh, in the collection so at least we have some uh, some numbers uh, and uh, some copy, copies uh, of these materials but we uh, were not aware that it can repeat once again and during the last two years we were running the project which called unarchiving uh, post industry uh, which was working with the local museums and uh, also private collections in the donetsk region it was uh, organized by the center for urban urban history Mari mariupol local history museum pokrovsk historical museum but also uh, our international colleagues from the university of saint andrews so during two years because the project was planned for one year but during two years because of covid uh, and pandemic situation it was uh, 
uh, expanded for two years and we were collecting and receiving the archives uh, of uh, home movies, uh, videos, photographs from the family archives in these uh, places, but also from the museums. And within this project, we organized last summer the uh, summer school and residency for artists and historians who were working together by uh, resyncing and reusing the archives that were digitized uh, during the project. That's why we call uh, it unarchiving, uh, because unarchiving is one of our uh, pub public programs uh, at the Center for Urban History, which experiments with different formats and different, different types of uh, reuse of archives to make them available uh, for a wider audience. Uh, for instance, we are commissioning the film out uh, films out of footage uh, uh, of our archives or providing the archives for the artists to experiment with them and organize some screenings, uh, exhibitions and other events. So last year in, Pokro in Pokrovsk, we had this uh, summer, summer school and now at the moment uh, Pokrovsk is uh, in really dangerous and really risky area uh, where the fights fights going uh, on uh, at the moment and we still have in our institution some the materials and some the collections that we just finished it, finished it to digitize a few months uh, ago so th these collections are in the safer places uh, another collection that was digitized during uh, that project is the collection of photographs and also amateur films from Mariupol Museum of Local History. As you probably know, since the war started, uh, Mariupol is uh, blockaded by the Russian military forces and uh, the, the city is probably totally destroyed we don't have people don't have the water su supply people don't have the electricity uh, most of the buildings in the city are destroyed uh, by the rockets and we don't have the connection with, even with our colleagues who live in there uh, and it's really hard and pay painful to talk uh, about this uh, situation because we don't know if those people are still alive even like our colleagues or the authors of the films that we digitized uh, during the last year so it's also how we uh, connected as an archive uh, to, to this war and since the war is started we were thinking about some program and or about such uh, programs uh, or screenings uh, based on the collection from Mariupol but uh, as the this situation with the city developed very brutally, now we even don't find it possible to talk about the city in this way, as it's totally destroyed. So it's catastrophe. And uh, talking about this uh, recent uh, experience uh, of war, of course, we postponed all our project we freezed our digitizing pro uh, process the, the second thing that i made uh, in the morning uh, when i uh, when the war started i just uh, went to the office to hide all the materials and all the collections that were in in in, in work in workflow at that moment and uh, to, to collect them and uh, take them to the uh, safest place that we have at our building at that day it was uh, hard to pre predict how the situation will de develop so now all the processes uh, are freezed uh, and uh, materials just uh, stored in our basement uh, but uh, after some time we launched few other projects uh, which are um, a few other projects in order to collect uh, the testimonies uh, of war, like the actual testimonies, such as photographs. 
So I'm mostly working uh, on the process of uh, receiving the photographs and collecting the pho photographs uh, of uh, today's war. Also, we launched our project of uh, oral history, which aims to record the oral history interviews with the uh, refugees and people who leave their homes uh, and hiding uh, from the war. So this uh, this uh, project is run by few institutions also in other con uh, countries. It was reviewed by the by the ethical commissions because all all the project that we uh, started now they are uh, really challenged by the ethical. Uh, questions but also copyright questions and uh, uh, we still have a lot of open uh, uh, discussions uh, what and how we should uh, collect so also we are collecting the web the materials and web pages which we consider as important at the moment and the probably like the newest uh, project for us is the archiving telegram the telegram is the messenger which is uh, used uh, by the most of uh, ukrainians now for communication so we are archiving archiving different channels which are providing the information about the war about the propaganda uh, about people who are trying to find themselves so we don't have uh, we, we don't know st we, we still don't know how to work with those materials and uh, how to use it in the future because there there is a lot of personal data uh, 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 a lot of uh, other content which is uh, not uh, 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 easy to use uh, at the moment so but we we understand that it's very important uh, to collect them and then we are discussing the ways and also the legal uh, legal uh, foundations how can we use it and turn it into the archive and also how to analyze uh, those uh, materials uh, for the future as a historical uh, historians so talking about strategy it's uh, really hard at the moment because we are not able uh, to plan uh, all our collections are shaped by the current situation and really like uh, and this situation is the it's the kind of external force uh, that uh, uh, working working against us so we are not able to make some other concept uh, conceptual uh, shape uh, to these archives uh, at the moment but uh, we are trying to collect it as a uh, the uh, important evidences and also we are thinking uh, about uh, all these collections as historians first of all so uh, and thinking about the perspective of uh, usage of uh, these materials and also one of another biggest project which we, will be related to our to, to our previous collection but also to uh, our newly gathered collection is the educational uh, program because we see uh, we were working previously on uh, the educational platform and now uh, we are really aware that it's very important to uh, study and teach uh, uh, history of Ukraine to explain it uh, to other people so we are launching the, the platform which will provide uh, the materials the syllabuses and also online courses which are based on our collections and they will be uh, available for the academia uh, all, all over the world so all and uh, the last thing probably is that uh, the most of our collections are correspond somehow to the, our research focuses. So we are trying to combine it uh, and uh, to use those uh, materials by ourselves to make them alive because we are, uh, really believe that archives should be alive. So uh, yeah, thank you at this point. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Oh, um, 
thank you very much. I uh, really, uh, there are no bounds to my uh, respect for what you do, because it's, uh, we librarians or archivists or museum people uh, have the task of uh, preserving the past. And you are at this moment busy with both preserving the past and preserving the present, which is under threat. So, uh, uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. I, I also forgot to mention the to another challenge is the backup, because uh, since the war started, we received like the tens of uh, offers from other institutions to provide the storage for the backup. We are really rare institution in Ukraine that has its own uh, server, but still like our archive is still like for three months, three weeks uh, back up in. And uh, then it's also the question of the internet connection, the question of uh, re the, uh, receiving capacities uh, from the institutions that provide us uh, their storage. So we are still in progress of uh, backupping, but still there are a lot of institutions that don't have the servers. They are storing their digital collections just on the hard drives. And that's the biggest challenge uh, at the moment. Even now I have close to me the hard drive with another archive that I'm trying to back up uh, from my home. And uh, the internet connection is also the, the issue. And uh, but but still the libraries and Ministry of Culture are trying to evacuate uh, the, the most precious collections uh, from, for instance, from Kiev at least, but because it's impossible to evacuate the collection from Kharkiv uh, at the moment. But still they are trying to ev evacuate uh, them uh, to Lviv. Okay. Um, I forgot at the very beginning to uh, ask the audience to put questions in chat. So I'm uh, doing this uh, right now. Uh, if you have any questions, please do uh, put them in chat. And uh, as uh, long as you don't come up with the questions, I'll have a few of uh, mine. Uh, okay, um, I have a very technical uh, question for uh, Sandra and Richard, or one of you. Uh, you, I don't think that you have mentioned uh, doing the OCR of the uh, newspapers. If you did, then I have missed it. Sorry. Uh, do you do it? Uh, yes. Are you happy with it? Uh, how <laughs> um, do you present the results? Um, the OCR we have done um, by our partners at Find My Past um, and they create um, OCR files in Alto format which then are made searchable um, within a database so that people can do full text searching. Um, but we do find that results are a bit mixed, especially when we're working with newspapers that have been digitised from microfilm. Um, and so the quality of the OCR is not as good with microfilm based digitization as it is for digitizing from the originals we found it's pretty good with doing it from the 19th century originals um, we're getting pretty good results but not not so good with the microfilm because there are you know the quality itself is not always as good as we'd like yeah. okay so uh it's only searchable or uh, is it also possible to download it in some form no not really um it is for the heritage made or it will be for the heritage made digital ones so um the heritage made digital content um is being processed by our partners that find my past and then the library is getting back a copy of all of the OCR as well as the images and we're making or will be making the OCR available on our research repository um, which is our platform for all staff 
research papers and staff research outputs. And so we are starting to load the OCR into that title by title. So researchers will be able to download all of the OCR from a particular newspaper title and to do big data analysis, um, computational research on it as a as a body of material. Yeah. Okay. Still, no suggest offers in the chat. This is nice as well. And uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, Alexandra, if you don't mind uh, telling us what kind of, because uh, I'll be coming back with the same question to the British Library people. Uh, so get ready. Uh, do you have any uh, real standards for digitization or what equipment are you, where are you using for the work uh, before uh, switching to this uh, emergency work? So like we have very like, how to say it, very flexible and wide uh, standard because the, the process of uh, shaping of our project is probably 15 years and since then we are just historians but not the professional archivists so since then we are trying to uh, give the shape to these archives and uh, to, to provide some at least general standards uh, to digitizing images and uh, other materials. Like talking about the moving images, it's even harder because we don't have some professional equipment, but still for descriptions, we are uh, using the Dublin Core st standard, which is adjusted to our needs uh, to describe uh, our, our, uh, our materials in our collections uh, like and and also using some general general uh, standards for for images uh, we are using the scanners and also mm, uh, mirrorless camera for digitizing the negatives uh, uh, at uh, our mm, in our in the progress and also in terms of software we a few years ago we launched the collective access platform that we are using for managing the data and managing the uh, files uh, and uh, descriptions though okay i guess it will be very difficult for uh, the two of you to answer this as uh, probably you had maybe not 769 standards, but still. Uh, could you please tell me also how many volts do you have where the material is kept? And uh, then for me, it would be the, the, the question that it would be the easiest to have one on one uh, digitization lab in every vault, but it's probably not feasible. Can you say something about that? So, so I, I can have a, a first try, and then Sandra can correct me when I make uh, when I make all the mistakes. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so so we do try and have uh, a standard approach with uh, things like imaging standards and and obviously cataloging standards. But it it is difficult when we have so many different models for working with partners and and often uh, our partners will have slightly different standards that they will use to ours. So um, we have a, a, a relatively flexible approach. But having said that, we do have various sort of fundamentals. So we um, we tend to use um, JPEG 2000 for image based um, image based content, but 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 it's not just image based content. We've got a, a huge amount of sound digitization that we're doing as well. So we have standards around that. Uh, we try and make sure that uh, for our we, we have a small number of cataloging systems where which are our sort of strategic stores for the for the metadata. So we need to make sure that we have kind of consistency across that as well. What tends to happen is it's usually the British Library staff that are making those catalogue records. 
Um, so we tend to have a, a greater sort of control over over that. So we have a uh, archives and manuscripts system that was developed in house um, that uses kind of uh, international standards like ISAG and um, and others. And then uh, we use Aleph for our published material. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is incredibly difficult. And, and one of the challenges for Heritage Made Digital and, and Sandra's team is looking at the legacy of the hundreds of projects that we've done over the years and making sure that we bring them all into, um, you know, A, that we know where they all are and B, that they are all sort of consistent in terms of the, the, those standards. But actually, in terms of sort of image format, actually things haven't shifted too much i would say over the course of um over the the course of these these projects um in terms of sort of different studios and and, and where we keep the collection so uh physically we're we're, we're we're based across two sites so we have our site in london and we have our site in in yorkshire and we have imaging services studios in in both of those sites uh, and they follow um similar workflows and similar standards um, and wherever possible we'll try and be consistent about those but for larger projects uh, we often will set up separate studios that are very much linked to our central imaging services so for example for um for uh for a long time for our newspapers uh the newspapers had a dedicated studio in, a, in an entirely separate location where where our newspapers were stored it's stored in north london uh, for our partnership with the Qatar National Library, uh, for our partnership with publishers, we often will set up mini studios that have um, a separate team of, of two or three or four people that will be doing that digitization. Uh, but Sandra can talk more about the, the specifics around standards. Thanks, Richard. Yes, we are. I mean, we for, for the cataloging, um, we tend to use ISAG for the archives and manuscripts, and we'll use um, RDA for for print material. And um, we capture a certain amount of information in Dublin Core as well. So particularly about the digital object itself. So things like um, the rights information, and we create a METS file for every digital object, and that will contain. Um, not the entire catalogue record, just sort of cut down piece of information from the from the main catalogue with a link back to the catalogue um, from where we'll pull the master data. Um, because we, we try to have the data stored in one place only. So for every kind of data, um, we, de we kind of denote a particular data source. So is it is it Aleph for, for the printed books catalogue? Is it the ISAG catalogue for manuscripts. Um, whichever one we choose, we will have that as the master because we don't want to have the same data in two different places and then it getting out of sync. So the METS file doesn't contain the entire catalogue record. It just contains a reference back to it. And if we want to make a change, we make the change in the master catalogue. And that data um, about the information about the bibliographic source is kept in just in the master catalog the rights information we keep in a separate database um, and then when we display the content online we have something called the metadata aggregator which takes the bibliographic data from the catalog the rights data and structural metadata from this other database and pulls them together into the triple if manifest which is the um which is the uh, kind of description um and um, file that contains all the information about the digital object itself. Sorry, that wasn't very well explained, but that's sort of what we do. <laughs> okay. Uh, Alexandra, I wanted to ask you, because well, I have a two questions which somehow try to blend to one to make it easier. Uh, the, you mentioned uh, about the architects' uh, plans or drawings which you were uh, digitizing. Uh, I guess you do not do the uh, new uh, architecture, so it's the archival stuff. Yes, that's uh, we already digitized the archives of few architects. Some of those archives are uh, contain like. 
eighty percent of photographs or negative films. So that that was like the photographs made by those authors, but also their uh, working materials such as sketches, images, plans, uh, and so so on, and also a few just the photographic documentation of the building and uh, the architecture made by those uh, architects. Uh, so yes, we are, but 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 we are not uh, working with like with the digital files uh, and the new newer uh, newer uh, materials from the uh, architects. But uh, but but I know that there is also some challenges uh, with these architecture ar archives and files and standards that were used previously by the architects, especially in the er early nineties. So some software which is not uh, working today so that's that also the challenge yeah i am aware of it okay and then uh, the telegram archiving uh, is there some standard for that or you just uh, tell so me? so my, my my colleague taras nazaruk will probably tell you more but uh, but telegram telegram itself gives you the chance to download the copy of for instance of some public channel channel in uh, uh, json or html for format so you can just uh, out, out, uh, download all the data all the con conversation conversations all the media files and so on that appeared in this channel you can just select the dates between which you want to archive and then you are just grabbing uh, all the, all the materials, but still, these Telegram archives they contain a lot of private information, private private photos, uh, and so on. So the, uh, I don't know the examples of this, uh, of archiving Telegram. So it will be the challenge for the for the future how to legalize it, how to work is it uh, work with these materials ethically? Because uh, as far as I know, at the moment there is more than uh, 500 uh, uh, gigabytes of the of this in information is already uh, archived, and at, and that's just the selected charts and selected channels, so that we are consider as important. Okay, okay. That's uh, impressive, must say. And um, yeah, I think that we'll be wrapping up uh, soon. I'll uh, ask you. Uh, it's it's difficult in my mind to ask you the general strategic uh, thinking which will be involved in the situation when there is no planning possible uh but still uh there is this question which uh, started in me when uh, i've heard about the number of projects you were doing so i wanted to ask you uh if you were the with the knowledge from now what would be one thing that you would change in your work on digitization uh, 20 years ago or maybe because <laughs> it's well it's a question of uh, the meaning of life and universe basically so uh, maybe we should just leave it there Was that a, a, a is that a question to all of us, Thomas? Or <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think the the one thing I'd, I it's not quite answering your question, but the one thought I have on this is that when we talk about digitization, it's it's not what, what tends to happen is we focus on the imaging or the or the or the technical bit. And actually, it's a much wider thing. Digitization is about everything that we do with our collections. It's about how we store them. It's about how we interpret them and catalog them and, and tell stories about them. And I think for me, taking a very wide view of digitization um, is really, really important in terms of taking that strategic approach. It's, it's really not just about imaging. Imaging and is, 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 is really important, absolutely, but it's it's much wider than that.
Okay. That basically answers my question. So uh, look as wide as possible and as far ahead as possible, I guess. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Sandra, do you want to comment on that or? No, I think I'd agree with that. The only other thing I think I would add is just document what you're doing because we've got um, quite a lot of documentation which it's taken a long time to kind of locate or um, get it all in, in order. And so I think when you're doing things, just documenting what you're doing and, and how you're doing it. I think going back to tell our 20 year ago predecessors that we'd be rummaging around trying to trying to sort all this out, I think we would Yes, do do a bit more around that next time around. Okay, thank you. Alexandre? Uh, well, probably I, like, I just want to tell that every time I meet the colleagues from other institutions which are bigger, such as, for instance, British Library, which are, we still have the same problems and still uh, the same uh, challenges, but on a, another scale. And since we are the smaller institutions and we are, we are more flexible, but still we are doing the mistakes. We are trying to uh, away, uh, avoid them and change them. And of course, uh, like the, 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 the pro probably the quality of the materials that we uh, were not able to digitize some, for instance, some very uh, sp specific uh, rare materials from the private collections, which are not uh, available for us uh, at the moment. Uh, so that's uh, one of the issue. Mm, the second one is probably like, uh, as uh, Sandra told, to reflect more uh, on uh, our uh, projects and also try to involve for instance, the research, more researchers and more people to use those uh, archives, because still we are making a, a huge effort uh, as for small institution, but we still need more feedback and need more the users uh, of our materials. So involving them in the process, probably, yes. Okay. Uh, by the way, everyone, uh, have a look at uh, the site of the Center for Urban History, vifcenter.org. It's, uh, uh, it's really impressive what they do with the stuff. They have a totally different approach than an average library or an archive. So uh, this is... Uh, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Keep up the good work and I'm uh, wishing you all the victory. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, well, British Library, thank you. And I'm uh, looking forward to seeing one point of access to all your millions and millions of objects and the stories which uh, go with them because uh, I know that you're doing that part as well. And um, thank you uh, everyone. I uh, hope to see you on the 7th of uh, April on our next uh, webinar. And uh, it will be about the project approach, planning, budgeting, workflow design, and, uh, well, the IFLA pack for digital preservation is signing off for the moment. Thank you for watching the first webinar in a series of open webinars on digitization. There are more recordings of past webinars at the Warsaw IFLA pack at National Library site. You can see the link to recordings at the address on the screen.